Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to the Rumi Forum once again. Uh, we're very, very, very honored today to have Dr. Robert Pape with us Thank here you. to speak on his new book, Cutting the Fuse, The Explosion of Global Suicide Terrorism and How to Stop It. So I think a lot of you are familiar now uh, with this book. And uh, let me just briefly tell you a little bit about Dr. Pape. He's a professor of political science at the University of Chicago, specializing in international security affairs. Before this book, his other most recent book, Dying to Win, The, Stra the Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism in 2005. His other publications include Bombing to Win, Air Power and Coercion in War, 1996, and numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals such as Why Economic Sanctions Do Not Work in International Security in 97, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism, American Political Science Review, August 2003. His commentary on international security policy has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, New Republic, Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, amongst numerous others. He's been on the News Hour with Jim Lair, Nightline, ABC News, uh, with Wolf Blitzer on CNN, Anderson Cooper and Lou Dobbs, Fox's John Gibson, CNN International, and of course NPR. In recent years, he has spoken to numerous universities, many political and government agencies, including, amongst many, Office of Secretary of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, Counterterrorism, National Counterterrorism Center, the Australian Parliament, the International Atomic Energy Association, among, as I said, many others, and many policy and jour journalist and community groups as well. Before coming to Chicago in 1999, he taught international relations at Dartmouth College for five years in air power strategy for the USAF's School of Advanced Air Power Studies for three years. His current work focuses on American grand strategy, causes and solutions to suicide terrorism, the logic of soft balancing in a unipolar world, and the limits and advantages of precision air power. Please welcome Dr. Robert Pape. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So please tell us about the book and uh, Cutting the Fuse. It's a very interesting title uh, and uh, the catalyst for That's right. Know, beginning um, well, as journey. your introduction suggests, I've been studying suicide terrorism now for quite some time. Yes, yes. Uh, it actually started on 9-11 itself. Uh, oh. On 9-11, you might remember there were questions about how many people died that day. Well, my background in air power turned out to be um, a bit helpful here for the media because I could say uh, that if it had been an air attack, say a cruise missile attack, mm -hmm. then we would look at the floor where the missile hit, assume a fire engulfed right. that floor, and then everyone from that point on down would have a chance to get out, and so you assume they would get out. From that point on up, no, and you wouldn't assume they would get out, they would right. die. So that allowed me to say somewhere between three and 7,000 people died that day, right. which uh, was um, helpful for the media, so I was on a number of talking head shows, and in the course of that, I was also asked questions about terrorism, even though I'm not a terrorism expert. Well, there weren't any terrorism experts, right? So um, I'm asked questions about this, and so I found myself trying to prepare for these media interviews right. by going to my library at the University of Chicago, by going to uh, various, uh, you know, sort of online, Lexus online things, try to learn about suicide sure. terrorism. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for the history of suicide attacks. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know, as a social scientist, well, who does a suicide attack and who doesn't do a suicide attack? Mm -hmm. And like most people, I immediately assumed Islam must be the cause. I went and bought a Quran to mm -hmm. find out what's wrong with Islam. I had never read the Quran before. Uh, but I was also very interested in collecting the information mm -hmm. about well, who does an attack and who doesn't? And as the media interviews stopped, I just kept going and ended up collecting what is the first complete database of all suicide attacks around the world. Wow. That database uh, was first published as part of an academic article in 2003. Mm -hmm. Then it was updated again as became uh, my first book on suicide terrorism, Dying to Win, published right. in 2005. Mm -hmm. And as you'll hear in just a moment, um, unfortunately the problem's getting worse, <laughs> it's not getting better. Right. Um, and we've just had this growing rise of suicide terrorist attacks. And um, so the, yes. uh, the latest book, Cutting the Fuse, uh, is looking at um, especially the last 
five years of suicide terrorism, but really the whole period overall, uh, much the way a medical researcher might study lung cancer. You see, suicide terrorism is the lung cancer of terrorism. Mm -hmm. It's the most deadly form, it's the number one killer, and it's associated with specific risk factors. Risk factors that become more evident the more you look around the world to see, well, who gets the problem, the right. suicide terrorism, and who doesn't get right. the problem. Right, exactly. I mean, and going, you know, moving on to talking about uh, the biggest, one of the biggest problems on, on the table right now, which is Afghanistan. Yes. I, I mean, this is, and this is becoming increasingly, uh, an increasingly big problem there, um, suicide, terrorism. Exactly, um, especially in the last five years, Jenna, you're correct. quite right. Uh, the findings overall, so we have now studied 2,200 suicide terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. 2,200. Uh, in the last five years, um, there have been over 1,800 suicide attacks. Uh, if we go back and look at the period 1980 uh, to uh, uh, early 2004, we'd only see 300 suicide attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from 2004 on, again, it's over 1,800. So it's obviously become a very popular strategy. Yeah, but why? Exactly. Why? Most right. people say, well, Islamic fundamentalism, that must be what's underneath it. Well, wait a minute. Have we really had a six-fold increase in the number of Islamic fundamentalists in the last five years? Uh, especially if Islamic fundamentalists are supposed to be killing themselves to do the suicide attacks, you right. see. Yeah. Is that really yeah. what's going on? Well, when you look at the data, what you see are lots of non-Muslim suicide attacks. Mm -hmm. For large parts of the last 30 years, uh, from 1980 to 2005, the world leader was not an Islamic group. Right. They're the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. a Marxist group, Correct. a yes. secular group, right. a Hindu group. Right. Lots of secular Muslim suicide terrorist groups as well, such as the PKK in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So what do they have in common if it's not really religion? It's they responding to a foreign occupation on territory mm -hmm. that the terrorists prize. Right. Not quite every attack, but over 95% mm -hmm. of all suicide terrorist attacks around the world since mm -hmm. 1980 are triggered by a specific uh, circumstance in the world. Right. A foreign occupation on territory the terrorists prize. That's the smoking right. of suicide terrorism. Right. Just right. as smoking triggers lung cancer, uh -huh. foreign occupation triggers both secular and religious attackers. Right. So you asked about Afghanistan. Right. Afghanistan is a prime example, Jenna, mm -hmm. of this particular logic at work. Before we toppled the Taliban in 2001, the fall of 2001, do you know how many suicide attacks were in Afghanistan's history? Mm -hmm. Zero. Uh -huh. Not a single really? one. Oh. And then something interesting happens here. For the first few years of the occupation, uh, there's only a teeny tiny number. Remember, that was the good war. There's no talk of the Taliban on the march or anything like that, right? There was the good war. Everything was going great. Suddenly, 2006, an explosion of suicide terrorism pops up at nearly 100 attacks that year, and they stay up that high. Mm -hmm. They have been that high just in the last year, even with Obama's surging of uh, more troops. In fact, the more troops we put in, the worse the problem has gotten. Um, but why? What happened in 2006? What explains this sudden yes. spike up, right? right. Well, um, the key thing you need to know is that in those first few years when we were, quote, occupying, we weren't spread around the, the whole country. We just had a few thousand troops in the country mm. in Kabul, in mm. the capital city. Mm -hmm. Why? They were protecting Karzai from being assassinated. That was their mission, their number yeah. one fear. Right. Then starting in October 2003, the UN gave us a mandate to spread forces around the rest of the country. And uh, the military organization, uh, the International Security uh, uh, Assistance Force, it's called ISAF, that uh, developed a brilliant plan as staffs will. Mm -hmm. Stage one was to put troops in the north, our friends, the Northern Alliance. Let's go to our friends. Stage two, the west of the country, more friends. Then starting in early 2006, they go to the south and the east of the country, the Pashtun homeland. That's when the suicide terrorism explodes. That's also, if you look at the details of the attacks, 83% <coughs> of the suicide attacks in Afghanistan are directly against American and Western combat forces mm -hmm. in the southern parts of the country. Right. Who's doing the attacks? 90% of the attackers are Afghan nationals. Mm 
And they're not just any old Afghan nationals, they're Pashtuns, mm -hmm. that is from the local areas, mm -hmm. immediately under the mm -hmm. occupation. Okay. So it's no wonder that as we put more and more troops into the southern eastern part of the country, yeah. we're getting more resistance to the occupation, and it's kind of a feedback loop. It kind of feeds on itself. The more terrorism, the more we've tried to solve the problem by putting in more ground troops, mm -hmm. but we're producing more terrorists than we're killing. So the solution? Well, I don't think we should simply cut and run and withdraw all American combat forces in a few months and just simply uh, avoid the problem that way. Why? I think we do have important interests overseas. I think we have important obligations for stability overseas, especially since we've caused so much instability uh, by inserting troops. Um, nor do I think we should simply stay and die. Uh, the longer we stay with our ground forces, the more terrorists we're producing <laughs> rather than killing. So this is not a good, uh, not a good business model, so to that's speak. That's what it sounds like. Um, yes. The better solution is a middle ground strategy I call offshore balancing. It's uh, a strategy that relies fundamentally on <coughs> offshore military power, mm -hmm. not onshore military power. That offshore military power could be air power, could be naval power, could be rapidly deployable ground forces that went in and out, uh, but should be used judiciously, only judiciously, uh, because after all, if the ground forces are provoking and producing the terrorists, the more we shift offshore, the more that in and of itself will simply cut the fuse and those terrorists will simply dry up. But what happens in the meantime while well, we're kind of transitioning? Mm -hmm. We should use economic and political tools, economic and political tools to empower local groups. Local groups, I don't mean at the national level, I don't mean to give Karzai or the president who's essentially someone we picked, the CIA picked, to run the country, more and more political power because it's not legitimate. It's just fundamentally illegitimate. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that we should use economic uh, transfers mm -hmm. uh, to reconstruct large parts of Afghanistan okay. um, and actually to even provide uh, local village level um, uh, um, uh, groups with the ability to defend themselves. And aren't we already doing that in some respects? I mean, isn't there money and, and funding going into these? I mean, uh -huh. USAID is there uh, yep. working on we're, programs we're, we're, such as this? We, we are, and it's about 1% of our effort. Right. So what I'm calling for is okay. not truly right. the use of a new instrument we've mm -hmm. never ever thought of before, right. but a rebalancing. Okay. Sure. You see, we spend a hundred billion dollars a year mm -hmm. on Afghanistan. A hundred billion dollars a year. That's think a about that for yes, a moment. Yes. Okay. It's hard to somewhere, think about. <laughs> somewhere around a hundred million. Mm -hmm. I didn't say a billion. A hundred million is USAID money, that money that you're describing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just think about the balance here, it's so far out of whack. Now, it's true there's also some other economic uh, tidbits that are occurring as well, not just USAID, that's a more prominent one. Sure. And so it's, uh, you, you might, if you stretch it, right. be able to find that about 1% of our budget <laughs> is being spent this way, but if you're spending 1% the right way and over 90 some percent the wrong way, producing more terrorists than you're killing, hmm. it's the wrong balance. So I'm calling for a fundamental shift in that balance. Right. So how is uh, these proposals, your ideas, uh, which I think make a lot of sense, uh, how are they being received? in uh, Washington. Well, one of the things that's really quite striking is that uh, the idea here of moving toward offshore balancing um, is uh, becoming more and more of interest to central actors in Washington itself. Um, um, it, when I did my first book in 2005, there were a lot of intelligence organizations who were very interested in getting my information because after all, they were interested in the motives of terrorist groups, sure. and I'm told that it had some effect in leading to uh, the use of economic tools to um, sort of split some terrorist groups apart. Uh, but uh, that's sort of a inside the bureaucracy or inside baseball kind mm -hmm. of contribution. Mm -hmm. What's really happening now that's quite striking is that uh, some major actors in Washington and the Navy, the U.S. Navy is the biggest one so far, have come out and publicly supported offshore balancing as the policy they want to pursue for the future. 
So uh, about a week ago, about 10 days ago, there was a large conference on my book on Capitol Hill. The conference was called yes. Cutting the Fuse. Yes. It was, uh, we had 300 people come to the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still on C-SPAN, so viewers can watch the C-SPAN. Yes, I would love uh, to watch it. I wasn't able to attend. It's, it's so. actually quite long. It's about eight hours, so yes. it's a long <laughs> conference. But what's important about pick. the most important thing that happened there uh, was the head of the Navy, Admiral Gary Roughhead, right. came and spoke, and the title of his speech was the Navy's role in offshore balancing. Mm -hmm. It's the first time the Navy has ever used that term. First time they've declared that as their policy. And it's really important to see that that's the current head of the Navy. So um, in terms of um, uh, having folks in Washington look at the policy, look at the data, we are getting actual serious looks from key elements of Washington itself. And the more they look at the data, the more they see that now with over 2,200 suicide attacks around the world, so 97% actually are tightly linked to foreign occupation. I don't mean it's a correlation, I mean it's cause and effect. This is very much now like the link between smoking and lung cancer. And so the reason to do Cutting the Fuse is because this book is providing so much more new information that this empirical linkage that uh, I first began to see in these initial articles in that first book after 9-11, is now moving from the stage of a hypothesis, a possibility, hmm. to uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. Beyond a reasonable doubt. That's why major parts of Washington are paying attention to this, and that's why there's a lot of good reason to cut the fuse by removing ground forces, but uh, moving toward a policy of offshore balancing in the future so that we can secure our interests overseas, meet our obligations overseas, but not provoke more terrorists than we're killing. Right. Sounds like a very good plan to me. All Thank right. You. Well, I have other questions, but yep. with our limited time, I will hand it over to our lovely audience. Yes, sir, in the front. Thank you. My name is Edward Marks, once upon a time in the State Department, once upon a time in a simpler world. Deputy Coordinator for Counterterrorism. Oh, very David good. Boutique terrorism, <laughs> as we call it. Uh, you've outlined a very interesting thesis, not, not just today, over the last few years. And uh, I, for one, am perfectly prepared to accept I think you've said something important. But I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you've tied suicide terrorism to the occupation thesis, the mm -hmm. occupation situation. Mm -hmm. And we've certainly seen that the past time, 20 years. I think you've proven that. But why, in Prior to when the Tamil Tigers started this in the late 80s, middle late 80s, you had none of this, although you had extensive occupation situations, specifically yep. in Afghanistan, yep. where you had a violent war of occupier and the same people were doing it now. What happened? What changed yep. in the 80s and 90s that this was picked up when it didn't work before? Yep. Well, uh, Mr. Marks, you're, you're quite right that something fundamental has shifted here. In the 1980s, if you look at suicide terrorism, you'll see there's just three attacks on average around the world per year in the 1980s, and then it starts to grow. Last year, 300 suicide attacks around the world. Um, and what, is hap what happened was, in the 1980s, suicide terrorism began uh, in Lebanon, it began as a response to Israel's invasion of southern Lebanon in June 1982 with 78,000 combat soldiers, 3,000 tanks and armored vehicles. A month after that is when Hezbollah was born. They didn't even exist before then. Then, over the course of the next year, for reasons we're still not quite sure why, Hezbollah just seems to have experimented with suicide attack. There no fought was, there's no good reason. They just seem to have experimented. And the fourth attack that they did was the famous suicide truck bombing of our U.S. Marines in Beirut in October 2000, uh, 1983, killing 241 of our Marines. The same day they hit the French, killing 58 French soldiers. Well, Ronald Reagan, no pacifist, decided as a result of that attack to withdraw all American combat forces from the country, really in just a few months, pulled everybody out. Um, and that event, that key event, is what got terrorist leaders' attention. Because here, th with the loss of just one person, they were able to take a superpowers army, small number at the point in Lebanon, just a few thousand, but still the superpowers army, and have them leave the country. So in terms of resistance to occupation, that example 
stood out. Now, it's still just one example, but that's what led the Tommels to experiment with it. We know in detail because it was the other way around. So it was okay. that's what led the Tommels. Their first attack was trying, a, was trying to carbon copy <laughs> the truck bombing in Beirut. It was actually, we have the, we know, a carbon, it was supposed to be a carbon copy. That attack is what encouraged Hamas leaders later on to start to use suicide attacks. That attack is what uh, uh, Bin Laden says is uh, the idea, gave him the idea for a suicide attack against the United States. Um, and it's just that one attack. I mean, it literally is the case that you saw one example of an extreme political outcome as a result of suicide terrorism. Um, and what's also interesting, though, is that it was limited to responding to an occupation. Because did Hezbollah suicide attackers follow America to New York? No, they didn't. Did they follow the French to Paris? No, they didn't. Uh, Israel withdrew first to a six-mile security zone of southern Lebanon in 1986, and then in May 2000 from the whole country, its army withdrew from the country as a whole. Hezbollah suicide attackers didn't even follow the Israelis to Tel Aviv. Since May 2000, there's not been a single Hezbollah or even Lebanese suicide attack, not even in the summer of 2006, when we had a three-week air war between Hezbollah and Israel. So just think about that for a moment. If this is supposed to be a bunch of Islamic radicals looking for any old excuse for a quick trip to heaven, we should have seen hundreds of Hezbollah suicide attackers then. But what I'm trying to say is that as much as that event, that, that famous uh, truck bombing caused Reagan to pull out, change his policy, as much as that event sent a message around the world that suicide terrorism could be used for defensive purposes to, uh, as a good resistance strategy to a foreign occupation, it stopped there. That's where it has really developed today, and that's why we're seeing it slowly become the new way of resisting occupations. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, especially now that we have Petraeus in Afghanistan, uh, mm -hmm. and he's kind of espoused this doctrine of clear, hold, build mm -hmm. for counterinsurgency operations. And we have things like the provincial reconstruction teams operating in, in Afghanistan. Uh, do you view this general counterinsurgency strategy as something that's positive, as something that's negative, that's something that needs to be tweaked? Is it just, like you said, a, a matter of degree of economic support? How do, we, how do you actually do that? How do you actually secure areas and hold areas without the kind of ground presence that we might have in Afghanistan and these sorts of questions. The other question that I have is there does seem to be uh, an increasing reliance on drone attacks, for example, in Pakistan or special operations forces going in and out uh, very quickly. Is that in line with, with what you're suggesting or is that something mm -hmm. that is uh, kind of antithetical to what you're suggesting? Uh, I think that both of those military prongs uh, are going in the wrong direction. Uh, the counterinsurgency idea where you put in military forces to grow the ink spot of control is exactly what's growing the Taliban. Uh, from 2001 to 2006, we weren't doing counterinsurgency. Remember I told you, we didn't start to go into the South until 2006. And um, how much territory do you remember hearing about the Taliban controlling in 02, 03? Remember, that's the period of the good war. The Taliban controlled nothing <laughs> in 2002, 2000. They start to control territory after 2006, in mm -hmm. 2007. That's when they start to gain the momentum. Why? Because we're pouring troops into the south and into the east, and what we're doing is we're fueling a lot of animosity, not just among the Taliban, the religious Taliban, the Sharia courts, and everything that you hear about the Taliban, but among the local population because they don't want these foreigners in their midst. That's, um, so the counterinsurgency doctrine itself, this idea of growing the ink spot, is itself a core part of the problem. Um, but I don't think we should be uh, replacing mass boots with mass drones. <laughs> you see, mass drones can also kill large numbers of people, can also inflict collateral damage, and in fact, the more you use mass drones, you're almost inevitably going to produce more collateral damage. Why is that the case? It's because at any point in time, there's likely only to be one or two important targets. So if what you say is, oh, I just don't want to hit one important target, I want to hit 10. I want to hit 30, I want to hit 50, you necessarily are going to go to second order targets, third order targets, fourth order targets. This is the way air campaigns are. 
Um, and so the more mass you use, the more you're drawn to less important targets, and the more those less important targets are often going to have uh, uh, be, be situated near civilians and cause collateral damage and the more you're just likely to make mistakes by the way think you've actually got someone dead to rights when in fact um, you're just killing an ordinary civilian um, we may think that they're they're a terrorist but we're certainly not arresting them we're not prosecuting them and so forth so no offshore balancing is not about um, replacing mass boots with mass drones why because again we take the ground forces away we do this over a period of a few years, we take them away, the terrorists dry up. That's what we're seeing in Iraq. In the last few years in Iraq, notice how we've pulled out 100,000 ground forces. What's happening to the terrorists in Iraq? They're down, the suicide terrorism, the key terrorism, is down 85%. They're drying up. Why don't we do mass drone attacks in Iraq? because there's no terrorists to kill, <laughs> you see? So it's not because we're making, having this technical fight or tactical fight of mass drones versus mass boots. Uh, no, it's because Iraq's getting better and better and better the more we've withdrawn the ground forces and we're shifting toward this policy of offshore balancing there. Yes, sir, in the front. Uh, okay. My name is Yad al -Haddad. I'm the former director of operations at the World Bank. Ah. And therefore, ah. my, naturally, I go toward the development side of what you're sure. saying. Um, I wish the common sense and the kind of research that you've done, I, I want to read your book to know more about it, uh, will pervade in the future. because There's a lot of sense in what you're saying. Um, but on the development side, um, let me uh, explain something here, and I'd like your comment on that. Okay. Uh, what I call the disconnect between the development paradigm and the political horizon. All right. Now, as you know, development uh, is a generational change, capacity building and what have you. And the appetite for waiting for that kind of change sometimes is not there. Absolutely. On the other side, you have an electoral cycle, four years, five years, whatever it may be. And the uh, tendency, the response, the policy response to any act of terrorism, including suicide terrorism, is more likely to be punitive action quick action and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that explains to some extent that 100 billion versus 100 million, yes. which you talk about in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, this disconnect, I feel, is kind of driving this imbalance. What can you do to, to correct it? And what's your comment on uh, that? So that's an excellent, that that's an excellent question. Um, and what we have facing us right now as a result of the economic crisis in the United States and the West um, is actually an opportunity. It's an opportunity because the more that governments are feeling pinched right now, the more they're being forced to reconsider uh, the models that they've been using for the war on terror in a serious way. The idea that we're going to keep paying a hundred billion dollars in Afghanistan year after year when it's getting worse and worse and we're, we're going in the wrong direction, under the economic circumstances we face, this is creating a chance for parts of the government to think seriously about alternatives. Uh, now it doesn't necessarily mean they'll pick the right alternative, but it does mean that we have an opportunity for them to hear uh, uh, alternatives more now than ever. And moreover, you're right about the disconnect of the time horizon, of the development um, horizon, and the political horizon. Uh, but it is the case that many folks in government realize that we need policies for regions of the world that are going to extend uh, not just into a year or two that we hold on by our fingernails for, but for <coughs> decades. Because we are going to have overseas interests in the regions for decades. Um, and I think that that opportunity with offshore balancing is a way to bring a group of folks in government together. This isn't a Navy policy. It's not a State Department policy. It's not a World Bank policy. It's not an Army policy. It's all of their policies. You see what I mean? And what would be very, very helpful would be to reach out to the different organizations, such as the World Bank, for the World Bank's role in offshore balancing. Zarina Shakir, I'm producer and host of a television show called Perspectives of Interfaith. And um, I, I have several questions, but I'll cut them down. Um, and I just want to 
uh, preface this all by saying $100 billion annually, that almost seems like a template for putting good money after bad policies. I mean, who a child could see if their piggy bank was being broken into, well, if I have to use pig here, but um, <laughs> um, that being the case, that a child would even feel that there's something wrong with this picture. But what I wanted to ask is um, a couple of really quick things. What really is the difference between suicide versus homicide, considering that mm -hmm. suicide is one person who takes their life, mm -hmm. but in a homicide, you can take your life and many other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So I've had some question about why mm -hmm. they've used the word suicide terrorists or suicide in general over all these years when in fact you're taking many more people with you. Mm -hmm. That's one. Um, I'd like to also ask, um, I just saw on Al Jazeera that Russia is getting ready to go back into Afghanistan um, with the blessings of NATO. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, they were there, they're out, now they're back. Okay, what's wrong with that picture? And last, WikiLeaks and some of the uh, revelations, and not just revelations, there are actual papers that they have come upon, whoever has given them to them. We knew a lot of that through Pacifica Network a long time ago. Yes. Why is it that it seems like um, the government here and other places, including the so-called mainstream media, is now beginning to um, open their eyes to some of this? Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, so let me just uh, try to take them uh, sort of in the reverse order. Uh, so WikiLeaks. Um, uh, I think uh, that it's no surprise to me that the mainstream media is slow in the West and the United States to come to uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, just as, by the way, during the Vietnam War, uh, there were large elements of the uh, mainstream media that it took the Pentagon Papers uh, to really kind of shake up. Uh, and why is that? Um, well, one of the things that I think we should just recognize is that when we were attacked on 9-11, it wasn't just um, Americans who were attacked, businessmen who were attacked, journalists were attacked. <laughs> so 9-11 was something that affected everyone in the country. And why should we not think that journalists would be uh, kind of aloof from being patriotic? Um, maybe their patriotism leads them to wrong decisions. Uh, a lot of times patriotism leads people to wrong decisions as well as right decisions. Just being a patriot doesn't mean, Ronald Reagan had this great phrase. He used to say, um, uh, you can be patriotic uh, carrying a flag over a cliff, but you're still going over a cliff. <laughs> so, so patriotism is a good thing, but we shouldn't immediately assume that every patriot leads to a right decision. Uh, and so I think that WikiLeaks um, is not new information about uh, the consequences of an occupation to anybody in Afghanistan, anybody in Iraq. Uh, I do think, however, that it's coming as quite a revelation to large parts of the American public. Uh, well, you, uh, Only if they've not been reading and listening to anything for seven years. Yeah. There's nothing well, new in WikiLeaks. Well, there's, there's, let's put it this way, the, the, the picture that's painted isn't new. The level of detail is very new, much the way the Pentagon Papers provided a whole level of detail into the kind of messed up nature of the policies in Vietnam. It's not that there weren't issues with it, sir. It's that the level of detail really is quite stunning. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, so that's my response, number one, and why it's also important, by the way, for the mainstream media to embrace the alternative new information that comes, uh, that comes to light, such as in cutting the fuse. Uh, it's not enough to sort of assume, oh, we have a book, it has new information, it's being published by the University of Chicago Press, it has all this credentials and so forth and so on, no, that's not enough. We need to, the, uh, with the media is rife with ideas that only Muslims do it. Only Islam is to blame for terrorism. So why shouldn't the American public be terrified of a mosque going up anywhere? They're, all they hear day after day is that it's Muslims who are causing the problem. Well, there we now have alternative information more powerful information um, about the causes of terrorism, and it's really up to the media to embrace that and educate the public. Uh, but your second point is on Russia and Afghanistan. Uh, it all depends on how Russia comes in. It all depends on how Russia comes in. I'm really not trying to paint black and white picture of cut and run versus stay and die. It's There's this middle ground position. And just as I believe there's roles here for different parts of the U.S. government, international community, and offshore balancing, so too with Russia. 
Uh, third, uh, with uh, suicide versus homicide, you're quite right that a suicide attack is two things. It's killing yourself and murdering somebody else. That's what's really, and the purpose of the suicide attack is really the murdering part. Um, but what happened in the early 1980s is that those initial suicide attacks were called suicide attacks because the element of the suicide was so striking. Uh, why would somebody do that? That has been with us for 40 years, essentially. And we may try. There have been efforts to try to call suicide bombings, homicide bombings. Fox News does this all the time. I was interviewed on Fox News um, a few weeks ago, and I was really stunned. They showed the title of my book, and then underneath it had Professor Pape um, uh, study on homicide bombings. So, and, and the problem is that Fox can do that over and over if they want to. But they're not really going to change the public's word for this. It's just because after 40 years, the public has gotten used to thinking about this with a certain word. And um, it's just not so easy for someone, even Fox News, to go and change that word. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to finish. Thank, oh, thank you, you so very much for being with us. I'm sure all of us would stay here all afternoon and speak <laughs> with you, you about this topic. But please do.